you can't go and franchise until you've kind of locked down the process and you've got happy customers and it's repeatable. Every company has to start directly. And once they've kind of got to that point, building a channel is kind of like franchising. I want to welcome you to my sales podcast, where we have one focus and one focus only. That is helping you, the sales community and sales leaders create more conversations with more qualified buyers, ultimately leading to improving your sales productivity and closing more deals. Each show, you will hear from sales leaders, practitioners, and influencers to help you find, engage, and connect with more buyers. I'm Mario Martinez Jr., and you're now listening to the Selling with Social Sales Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Selling with Social. And today, for the first time in Selling with Social history, yes, the first time with Selling with Social history, we've got the man, the myth, the legend, Jay McBain, actually from Forrester, Principal Analyst, Global Channels. And when I talk about the first time, I'm talking about actually a topic that we've never covered on Selling with Social, and that is all around global channels, channel selling, all things related to channel sales. Jay, my friend, welcome, man, to the show. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to be here. I gave an introduction to you. Obviously, people know that you know, you're with Forrester, Global Channels. Do me a favor. Just talk, give a little bit of history. We've got salespeople. We've got sales leaders. We've got sales enablement leaders, marketing leaders, all listening in to Selling with Social show. And they want to know, who is this guy that you know, I introduced as the man, the myth, and the legend himself behind channel partnerships, alliances, alliance programs? Other than that, give us a little background about yourself. Sure. I've been in channels or around channels probably for 25 years. I was a sales leader at uh, IBM, did a lot of channel work there, uh, went over to Lenovo. So spent 17 years between the two companies. Uh, I actually started up my own company about eight years ago and uh, was a founder and CEO of an analytics and AI company built around channels. So been on both sides of the fence and now I'm at Forrester for a couple of years analyzing, researching, doing a ton of speaking, and uh, trying to highlight the 75% of the world that goes indirectly. Mm. So most sellers out there, most of your business will flow through some channel, a retailer, a dealer, indirect wholesaler, agent. Every one of the 27 industries has a different name for it. But almost everything you do in your personal and professional life goes through a channel. Hmm. Did not know that stat. That's an interesting one. <laughs> we'll get back to that one. But you know, for those of you listening in, I don't know anybody else who's got this many accolades all within a very specific niche and around channel and alliance. So hear me out, guys. We've got top 40 under 40 by the Business Review, top eight influencer by Channel Partners, top eight thought leader by Channel Marketing Journal, top 20 visionary by Channel Pro, top 25 by CDM Magazine, top 50 channel influencer by Penton, top 100 most respected thought leaders by VSR and the list keeps going. Jay, you got more accolades than I've got in, uh, well, anything else. <laughs> so this is a, an exciting topic to me that you're listening in because again, we've never spoken about the channel and what the channel means to sellers as well as sales leaders and how to leverage that. Uh, Jay, before we get started, I always ask this question, as you know, as a consumer of the show, tell us something. Nobody would know about you by looking at any of your social channels. All right. Uh, well, a few things. One is I'm Canadian. So at some point you'll hear an oot or an a boot and, and you'll figure <laughs> that out. Uh, I've got four kids, all of them daughters. Two of them are in college and two of them are in diapers. So I've got. Oh, little... wow. Are they twins? Uh, they're not. Oh, so you just had them all back to back. Yeah. Both of them are, uh, you know, 20 months apart but a 20 year gap between the two sets. So wow. sometimes I feel like a grandfather. And so I've got a, my one daughter just graduated college going to law school. And then next week, my other daughter graduates uh, VPK, which is uh, 
right before kindergarten. So got both sides going. Wowzers. What made you start all over again? I don't know. I took kind of a, a gap and um, got married again and then uh, thought uh, I didn't kill my, my first two kids and then they turned out somewhat normal. So, uh, hey, maybe we'll try this whole thing again. Are you sleeping yet? Yeah. So, see, so when you say, yeah, like, at 20 months, I was hoping you'd say no. So I'd be like, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> My two boys, I got to tell you that uh, they were on the clock every two, maximum three hours until we tried to break them. We tried to break them by that habit at 10 months, at 12 months, at 14 months, and they would not do it. It would not do it and until one day, one night, both of them on their own decided, ah, I'm not going to wake up anymore. I'm going to start sleeping through the night. Boom. It was overnight, just like that. And it was like both of them are 14 months uh, when they decided to do that. But otherwise, it was clockwork. That was a lot. So thus, I'm done after two. I'm done. I'm absolutely done, man. <laughs> I'll tell you again in 20 years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny because thinking about when I had my first child, before that, the paternal instinct was very strong. Before the second one came, I thought, mm, you know, I think I could, I could go for another one. Second one came, I'm telling you, within a matter of days, the paternal instinct was gone. It was like, I didn't want any more children. I was satisfied. I was complete. I was made whole. And that feeling has never gone away. And it was a very big, drastic change. So, all right, well, let, let's get started, man. Let's talk about some meat and some depth. You mentioned an interesting stat just a second ago that 75% of world trade is flowing indirectly. So, with that in mind, why is it that channels and partnerships have been such a blind spot for sales organizations and for marketers? I'm not actually quite sure. I, I, I study the, the subject and there's probably six or seven different reasons. But, you know, just to simplify, I, I think that the channel is a very busy place. Uh, in most organizations, it's siloed. So you'll have a channel leader that has sales, marketing, operations and finance that report to them. Uh, they have about 90 different things that they're doing every day. They're putting out fires, they're mediating channel conflict. So there's so much energy going on. I, I think most are just trying to manage the complexity of, of running a channel. Over the last 20 years, though, you've had you know sales leaders that really took a scientific approach. And there's a bunch of tools and processes and people, and, and I know you talk a lot about this, that have really you know changed that art of selling into a science. You know, 10 years ago, the same thing happened in marketing, marketing automation tools. You know, CMOs now spend more money on technology than CIOs. Yeah. A tech stack. We've all seen that chart with 7,000 logos on it. Yeah. And this is their job. It's a much more technical job. And now I think 20 years later, the organization focusing on direct sales and direct marketing is starting to figure out that the last mile to the customer is actually paved through local business or, or your channel, your partnerships, your alliances, and others are actually the ones that either transact or heavily influence your customer, you know, towards your brand. So with that in mind, if you think about uh, a lot of organizations, when they start out, especially in the startup world, they obviously usually don't think channel. Let me, let me start with the channel, right? Even if Ingress ourselves, when we formed, it's all about direct, right? Going direct. What should we be thinking about when we're looking at within a, as a sales leader, right? As we look at the organization, how to grow and scale it, how to increase those revenues is the channel, the, the, the magic bullet, the silver bullet. Uh, it's one of them. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of stats about the modern buyer. Uh, you know, for example, a B2B buyer starts to look more like a consumer. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think every seller now knows that your buyer is spending 68% of their time digitally before talking to you. Mm -hmm. You know, they're doing a Google search. They're on social networks. They're in peer groups. You know, just think of the last time you bought a car. You all went online. online and you watched all the videos, you watched all the peer reviews, you went on social media, you talked with your friends, you went and configured it, priced it, chose the color and the packages. And by the time, you know, you went and look at the invoice pricing and, you know, in behind the scenes, by the time you got to the dealer, you were pretty done. Like you were, you were in good shape and you knew more than the sales rep did. Theoretically, hopefully people are doing that before they walk in so they could at least shave off maybe an extra hour or two off the time, right? <laughs> right, but it doesn't. Today it's broken when you actually get totally. to the dealership, which by the way, the dealer is a channel for all the car manufacturers. Yeah, Everything breaks and you end up sitting there for eight hours 
pulling your hair out, you know, trying to get a deal from the manager. And this idea is you already know the invoice cost. You already know within a hundred dollars yeah. and why you can't get that car delivered to your driveway and then hand you the keys and you pay a hundred bucks more for that. I'd pay a thousand dollars more for that. Absolutely. hundred percent away from that entire process. And this is now not just car sales. It's all 27 industries. And basically buyers are telling us that they've spent this 68% of time. They, they're smart. They've educated themselves. By the way, they've used on average five different kinds of channels to get to that level of knowledge. So these are people and partners and could be potential partners of yours as a salesperson that could be influencing the buyer. The majority of them, by the way, get to vendor selection before ever talking to a salesperson. Hmm. So they're actually making calls and things like that and and going into a project without ever talking to a salesperson. And they've informed what they're going to do. So getting very obsessed on that first 68% has nothing to do with the channel, but understanding that this digital journey that the customer's on up until the point of transaction can be heavily influenced by others. You're going to try to get your organization on page one of Google. You're going to try to do all the social and email and all the digital marketing. But there's a better chance that Larry driving the white van that lives a mile away from your buyer is going to get on page one of Google. Why? Because Google favors local business. Facebook favors local business. If you're within a few miles of a buyer, you organically show up number one. So as a seller... You want to obviously influence your your buyer the best way you can directly, but there's a better chance that you're going to influence them indirectly. Hmm. So if Larry in the white van goes into that opportunity and basically their website is syndicated content from you, you use Larry's SEO and and help Larry get to the front because a click to Larry is now a click to you as a brand. So if you look at it as a salesperson, you now have a bunch of influencers that can get your buyer to choose you without ever talking to them. That's the first major phase of selling. The second phase is transaction, the transaction itself. And now everything is going to subscription. So all businesses are moving to subscription, renewals, retention. There are a bunch of partners long-term. We're talking forever in your sales cycle. There is no end to the customer journey now because every renewal is uh, part of the journey. So now you have a bunch of downstream partners as well servicing, supporting that customer so that they remain with you for the long term. So there's three different parts of where a channel comes into the equation. And if you're not working with channel partners effectively, you're missing out where your competitors might be. Now you gave the example, and by the way, a great example, Larry, the local local guy within market. How does that story change or does it if you're looking at maybe a technology-based organization where you don't have Larry driving the white van pulling up to someone's home, it's a product-based, SaaS-based, um, application-based, infrastructure as a service, something like that. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, there's 175,000 SaaS companies today. Oh my God, really? 175,000? By the way, 10 years ago, there was 10,000. No kidding, really? 10 years, 10 years from now, there's going to be a million. So, and I can go into great detail in terms of what's behind these numbers. But there's 175,000 companies trying to get the mind share of the buyer. Yeah. You know, we mentioned earlier this MarTech stack, which has 7,000 7, levels on it. There's 7,000 of the 175,000 that are out there trying to get their name and you know their product into the conversation. So there are potentially millions of different channels. There's all these hundreds of thousands of software companies. There's so many permutations going on that the ability to do it direct anymore is almost uh, impossible. Earlier this week, Salesforce, which is one of the biggest SaaS companies in the world, you know, just declared that they're going to double their business in the next few years. They've done all the sizing. They paid for all the big research. And the net of it is they have to bring on 250,000 partners to be able to double their business in the next three to four years. They understand that doing it alone, doing it just through the app exchange and just through the 5,000 sellers that work there is not going to get them to to double their business. It's a channel play. And within the 175,000 companies, about 30% of them now have channels. And the next 30% are looking to build channels, knowing that doing it alone in today's permutations is almost impossible. Repeat that last stat one more time. Yeah, so 30% of the 175,000 have some level of channel built 
In other words, they brought on partners, consultants, system integrators, uh, VARs, resellers, MSPs. I mean, there's about two different types of businesses that they partner with, but they understand that getting to the buyer at that particular time, especially in that first 68% of the journey, especially being a small SaaS company is almost impossible. You can't run a Super Bowl ad. You can't do consumer level marketing, like run a billboard. You've got to get to that exact buyer. That buyer, by the way, is a particular line of business. You know, the head of sales, head of marketing, head of finance, HR, operations. They're also, you know, in a specific sub-industry. There's 297 sub-industries. They're in a specific geography, you know, country or province or state. They're in a specific sector size or um, segment of the market. You know, they could be an SMB customer. They could be a mid-market. They could be an enterprise. And then finally, you know, there's 40 layers of the tech stack today that a SaaS company has to be concerned with. If you multiply those five vectors together, there's 35 million conversations going on in the marketplace right now. Wow. This is the point about channels. There is no way in a direct sales organization, even as one as large as Salesforce or Microsoft or IBM or any of these companies that have mastered Salesforces, there's no way that they get into even a fraction of those 35 million conversations without getting and influencing the influencers that are. Well, that's why like companies like, and I I could be have the stat wrong, but I did hear the stat that Microsoft, I think it's almost 90% of their revenue is influenced by the channel, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so here's Microsoft who has 400,000 channel partners today. Wow. It is the biggest channel in the world in any industry. Uh-huh. They are bringing on 7,500 partners a month. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. I, I don't know how to onboard that many people. Yeah. Uh, of massive. those 7,500, 80% of these new types of partners are non-transacting. These are not resellers or VARs the way you would have known them in the, in the past, the past 37 years. Uh-huh. These are consultants and system integrators and ISVs and born in the cloud and ecosystem players and all different kinds of DevOps and other things that don't sell your product. But those 7,500 people a month are in these conversations, you know, part of these 35 million conversations. So how does Microsoft not only go win Azure, how do they go win Dynamics? How do they go win Office 365 and Microsoft 365 products? How do they get on top of that and start winning security and compliance and you know, some of their collaboration tools? I mean, they've, they've got their fingers in a lot of pots. They understand that they may have to have a channel of a million people wow. to influence those 35 million conversations to make sure that Microsoft is well-placed when that customer gets to vendor selection. <laughs> it's so funny because obviously Microsoft acquired LinkedIn and we're, we're a champion of teaching sellers how to leverage LinkedIn. And I still can't figure it out for the life of me. I just can't figure it out. LinkedIn refuses, refuses to build out a channel. They do not think that they should have a channel. They want to go at it alone. It's the stupidest move I've ever seen. And they, I just don't get it. And they keep fighting Microsoft on building out a channel. Microsoft wants them to build out a channel. So now they're, they're dabbling right now with, uh, I think it's five, five of, their, of Microsoft's largest systems integrators that, that's selling you know, the platform in conjunction with Dynamics, but they want everything to go direct. It's like, what SaaS company, especially in Silicon Valley, has that strategy. I just don't get it. Why would companies not do that? Why would a company like LinkedIn not recognize the power of the channel? Well, I think they have 26 billion reasons or whatever the, the cost, <laughs> cost Microsoft. But, Fair uh, enough. <laughs> I, I would call those probably lump them in with Facebook and Twitter and, and Snapchat. You know, there are some exceptions which have the network effect. The point where you get hundreds of millions, if not billions of users now the whole business model goes to monetization. Mm-hmm. How do we get a buck or two per user? Yeah. It's a little bit of a different business model than I think we've ever known. Well, and I should have focused you in on the sales solutions division. Right. which sells Sales Navigator and those solutions. Navigator. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And their Elevate product, right? It's the employee advocacy solution, right? So focusing in on that, they are not interested whatsoever in sales solutions and doing partnerships. And it just, it makes no sense to me as a SaaS product. Yeah. And I I think they will be, you know, part of the maturity and part of the, you know, further development. And a few years from now, you'll probably start to see them branch into some of these areas. 
Well, they're being told to by Microsoft, so hopefully they do it quickly. I want, I want to switch gears on you a second. You talk about a concept called the third stage of sales and marketing. The third stage. Tell us a little bit more about what this concept means. Yeah, so I briefly touched on it. So 20 years ago, by the way, Salesforce became a thing. There was 350 CRM companies at the time. Not a lot of people know that. Wow. And today, there's only a couple of winners. Those other 300 companies, a lot of them didn't go away. They just went up a level into the app exchange, into the marketplace, you know, doing other point solutions. Right. But before that, if you ever talk to a salesperson pre-CRM, you know, a sales leader, yeah. you know, they talk a lot about being born to be a salesperson and gut feel and things like that. And yeah, absolutely. You know, now sales is basically the seventh decimal point. It's pure science. And when they get into the boardroom, when they're in front of the board, in front of the CFO and CEO, they're talking... You know, and when they're asking for investments, they're asking pure scientifically. And that's been a 20-year journey now yeah. you know, to get there. But that was the trigger point 20 years ago. And that's actually what CRM was designed for, was to help support the finance so that the CEO could essentially develop a basis of revenue and bookings and, and forecast those types of things. So yeah. just make makes sense. It was never built for the salesperson. Never built for the salesperson. But, Still uh, not built for the salesperson, but go ahead. <laughs> but, but obviously, it's been a big benefit to leaders. And by the way, sales leaders, if you go back over 20 years ago, were usually people that have been around forever and good relationship people. And now, I mean, they're, they tend to be younger. They tend to be you know, very technology-focused, very scientific in terms of the way they do it. That same thing happened 10 years later, which was 10 years ago, 2009, in marketing. If you talk to somebody before that, you usually heard things like 50% of your marketing dollars were wasted. You just don't know which 50%, you know, ha, 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 ha. Right. Well, marketing automation and then the MarTech stack that came on top of it bolted down marketing and gave the levers and dials for a marketing person to get into that boardroom and be able to compete for those same investment dollars. Right. If you give the sales leader a million bucks, he's going to hire you know, 10 people. They're going to make this many phone calls, this many leads, blah, 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 blah. Here's the result. Well, if you give me that million bucks, I'm going to go run a SEO campaign, email. I'm going to put up a billboard, blah, blah, blah. Here's my levels and dot. I can beat the salesperson. I can actually drive you more revenue via marketing. That's now 20 years focused on direct sales and marketing. And 75% of your business is going indirectly you've kind of had a blind spot in terms of this third stage, which is the channel. They own the last mile to your customer, literally. Local businesses, distributed businesses, the ability to co-sell and co-market with them at scale is that last mile. So channel enablement becomes this third stage where I have a channel software tech stack that has 106 channel software companies that are probably gonna turn into you know, five winners like we've seen in the other two stages over the next few years, you want to get the channel leader into that same boardroom competing for those same dollars. Because by the way, the channel can probably drive more than direct sales or direct marketing, but they just don't know it. They don't have the number. So if you give me a million dollars, I'm just going to spread it over like peanut butter and hope good things come. Where you need that person to be in the boardroom saying, this is exactly what I'm going to do with a million dollars. This is what I'm going to do to onboarding. This is what I'm going to do for training, incentives, is what I'm going to do with co-marketing and market development funds and all this. Here's my levers and dials, and I'm going to drive you more than these direct bozos, and this is exactly how I'm going to do it. This is the next 10 years, and this is the focus where I think you're going to see technology, people, and process really develop quickly. The next unicorns, the next Marketos and Eloquas and Pardots are going to come out of this space. Give me an idea. Predict, obviously, channel management software. I don't even know what the category is called. Is there a category for this yet? I have six categories. So again, the channel software tech stack, we can you know, include the link later. But by the way, you know, Forrester has been around for decades and decades and decades as a leading analyst firm. That software stack, the channel one, is the fifth most read blog in Forrester history. It's only been out a few months. Wow. So this is how you know, popular this channel story is getting. And the ability, so the categories of software is partner relationship management, PRM, as compared to CRM. There is TCMA, which is through channel marketing automation, which is basically taking what you do today in direct marketing automation, but doing it through, to, and with your partners and having the you know, budget and money and all the capabilities of doing that. Then there's channel incentives, 
there's channel data management, there's channel finance, there's channel enablement. Those are the six categories. The entire thing adds up to over a billion dollars in SaaS sales today. And it's growing faster than the direct categories that we've talked about in terms of sales and marketing software. Wowzers. I definitely had heard of PRM, partner relationship management uh, software. It did not know the growth is actually exceeding direct. So here's the thing. If so valuable, and if the growth curve is high, why, again, going back to the strategy, Vangresso, we just laid out our, uh, finalized our 2019 strategy. Yes, I know it's, uh, it well, actually was April with us when we finalized it. It's, it's the beginning of second quarter. And a big one for us is focusing on the growth of a channel. Who are going to be folks out there that will be independent sales channel consultants for us that will actually sell the platform and the service as now that we've productized our, our program and our training capability sets, who will be out there that can help expand and growth? And that is how we are going to, I talked about from early on the road to 30 million, right? That's our road to 30 million in terms of revenue for us. Okay. So we know we have to do it, but what do we do? Like, how do we do it? What's the focus? Like, so if I'm a sales leader and I'm like, man, I really need to dial this down. I need to figure this out. What should I be looking for? What should I do first? Did you read the tipping point way back in the day? That was a long time ago. Yeah. So there's this amazing chapter two where he talks about Paul Revere. And I get to have this conversation probably a couple of dozen times a week, you know, with with big clients and obviously on stage. There's a point of super connectors that if I were guiding your $30 million strategy, I'd first point you to your buyer and take you through that first 68%. What does a day in the life of your buyer look like right from day one before they even know what they don't know, you know, start their journey. But who do they touch along the way? So I'd ask three questions of your buyer. What do they read? Where do they go? And who do they follow? So I was actually able to do this for IBM and do it for Lenovo. Uh, When I moved from Canada to the US, I didn't know anyone. I was always a Canadian manager. So I had to get into this big market without knowing anyone. You're kind of making fun of all the lists that I'm on, the top this of that and the top eight of this. I wasn't making fun of it at all. It is kind of funny though, but this is the result of a Paul Revere strategy. So I went and I figured out very quickly on Google that there's 54 channel magazines around the world. Easy to find out. I went and found out that there's 150 channel shows. So that answers what they read and where they go. The webinars, the podcasts and everything else basically goes beyond there. There are a bunch of associations, peer groups, vendor groups, distributor groups. So you drew the, I drew a big map on one piece of paper of all these sources of what people read and where they go. And this is almost, you know, $10 an hour intern work. But if you start going through these events that they go to, who are the speakers, write them all down, the keynote speakers, try to figure out, you know, how big the event is. So to give them points for speaking, deduct points, obviously, if they're paying to be up on stage, add points if they're there as an industry expert. Yeah. But start going from show to show. Look at who the board of advisors are. Look at who the board of directors are. I started writing down names. I went through all 150 shows. I went through all the magazines. Who's on the front cover? Who are they writing about? Who's submitting content, podcasts, webinar, kind of social media? Like, who are the big people in this game? It was basically following the breadcrumbs. In the end, I got to close to 5,000 names, but it was quantified. Every time I saw somebody twice, I gave them a check mark. And then I quantified that check mark. You talked at a little road show in front of 100 people. Great, two points. You know, you're a member of the association and, you know, you stood up and part of this community. Great, two points. Oh, you keynoted the big show or you're on the front cover of the big magazine. Eight points. At the end, though, these 5,000 people, I just descended, you know, sorted it descending. I actually published the top 100 people in channel and I give the points in the algorithm on how I do it. What I learned, though, is if you ask this colossal question of what do you read, where do you go, and who do you follow as a buyer, the answer in my industry was 31 communities. Some of them were run by associations, some of them by vendors, some of them by distributors, some of them by media companies. It didn't matter. There was 31 places that these people got together. If you go in and influence those 31 places, and especially the top 100 super connectors, like these are the now the Kim Kardashians of the channel, and over time earn their endorsements. They each have big tribes. They all have over a thousand Twitter followers. They're all big on LinkedIn. They're all big on Facebook. 
But once you start to basically make a science around building your business around a channel, it's exactly that's those steps. So way back to my story on Paul Revere, a bunch of people left on that midnight run. Yeah. It was only written, you know, the poem was written about Paul Revere because he was the biggest super connector in Boston in 1776. Even though he was a silversmith, like he wasn't the mayor, he wasn't the governor. He was just a you know lowly little silversmith, but yep. he knew everyone. And when he knew he went on that ride, he only told four people that the British were coming in every town. It got him going quickly. He didn't have to ring the church bell and wake up everybody. You know, he didn't have to go through the long process. Back then, the British were always coming. So he had to get people that were trusted. He had to get people that could make the story tip in that town and could do it quickly. And so he did that approach, which, you know, in my world would be the 100 people, the 100 top people, and the big events and the big, you know, things that they read. And that's how you win all those awards. You start interacting and touching this market and become one of the top people in six months. So the answer for you is, you know, how do you get to 30 million? You go back through that same process. And if you can actually build out what your buyer does a day in the life and what they inter- who they interact with, and before they come to a decision to spend money with a company like yours, who are all the people they touch in that 68% before they ever get to talk to you? If all of those five people on average mention your name, you're pretty well guaranteed to win the business sight unseen. Well, there you go. That's how you put together a channel strategy (laughs) to accelerate that. (laughs) I love that. So for Kurt Shaver, who's our CSO, uh, who listens to the podcast, there you go, buddy. There's your answer right there. (laughs) 30 million Um, by next year. 30 million by next year. Yeah. The program just got accelerated by just by a few years. (laughs) I love it. Does this have anything to do with the concept, uh, the term that you coined a couple of years ago, which is the shadow channels? It does. Uh, So when we started studying these new buyers, you know, we have in my industry, like, you know, if you look in technology, for example, as an industry, there's 600,000 Larry's around the world, you know, services business, doing their thing, bars, resellers, MSPs. Yeah. When you look at them, I just assumed, you know, with this new buyer, you know, the line of business buyers making two thirds of all tech decisions today, I just assumed they'd be in the room because they're the technology experts. Yeah. What we started to hear from the buyers and we started hearing from the, the VARs themselves is they weren't in the room. It was this massive change happening just in the last 18 months where every company in every industry is becoming a tech company. You know, from every forklift manufacturer, ever, every train builder, every company is adding IoT and software and every hotel, every car is a driving computer now. So basically every company becoming a tech company. Every service company in every industry are also becoming tech companies. There are almost as many accountants as there are VARs in the U.S. There's 150,000 of them, CPA firms. Hmm. 81% of them now do tech services. They're a new channel. Hmm. Digital agencies you know, have called on the CMO, like Mad Men style, for 100 years. Now, 78% of them are doing tech services. They're installing that MarTech stack that we talked about. Their base business has become commoditized, like doing tax and audit or doing creative and concierge work is a commodity. So they're seeing the 75% margins in being a tech services company. So there's all these system integrators and ISVs and all these dozens of different kinds of companies that are not traditional, but they're influencing the buyer. And because 10 years ago, we used to call this new buyer shadow IT or rogue IT, I call these new players shadow channels because they serve shadow IT. But today, 65% of all decisions go in this direction. So it's not in the shadows anymore. These shadow channels are no longer in the shadows. I mentioned 80% of Microsoft's 7,500 partners a month would be you know, shadow channels, but they're not in the shadows. AWS has 3,000 a month. Google has 2,000 a month. Salesforce needs 250,000 of these players. These are front and center now. And I don't, I think they're not even alternative channels anymore. These are the channel of the future. Hmm. Interesting. So how does a sales leader then start planning to, to leverage these particular uh, channels, this shadow channel? So as a sales leader, it goes back to the Paul Revere story. It all starts at your buyer. 
if you envision, like you look up in the sky, sky and you've got, you know, stars and moons, that's how many permutations we're looking at here. Sure. Okay. So I talk about 35 million of this and a million of that. I mean, there's no way as a sales leader, you're going to start tracking a spreadsheet or your CRM with all these permutations. But if you go as a sales leader and look at your ideal customer, your ideal buyer, mm-hmm. what industry are they in? What do they do for a living? What uh, geography are they in? What size of customer do you specialize in? What parts of the product do you, if you start answering on those vectors, you're in a very specific space and you might be in multiple, but you're in a specific space on those 35 million conversations. Once you, that's now your star, your, your customer is obviously the, the center of the solar system. They're, they're, they're the sun. Who are all the planets orbiting around this sun? So, you know, it's a celestial view, but you're going to have all kinds of businesses and all kinds of people that are influencing your buyer during that first 68%, during the transaction, and obviously long-term every time you renew. So at the beginning, you st- as a sales leader, who are these planets? And could we bring them on as partners where it's a win-win? I can help them get to more deals and more conversations and get more downstream benefit and and business out of it, they can help me get my name implanted sooner in the buyer conversation Mm -hmm. and perhaps help the buyer get to vendor selection before I or my team even talk to them. That's this new buyer centric, you know, kind of model. It's a celestial model. You're looking at stars and moons align, but you've got to oversimplify this 35 million things and get it to a place where you're strong. That's how you start building a channel. You know, it's funny. One of our largest clients uh, that we work with, we're actually training their channel sales organization. And we've got uh, about 350 or so folks that are from the Alliance, the ISVs, the managed ISVs, the channel uh, segmentation. And these folks are all responsible for working with the partners that you're talking about, right? This is what their job is. And as we go through and we look at how to train them, this was the first time that I ever took on like teaching sellers how to sell with the channel through, in this case, selling with LinkedIn. And so it was very interesting, very eye-opening because while the channel sellers or channel managers, if you would, or the alliance managers, they're not direct. They don't go out and hunt for the customers. They're supporting the partners who are going out. And on top of that, they're wrestling with potentially competing priorities that a channel salesperson. So you've got the channel manager, the managing the channel, the company that's an ISV or a partner, right? They've got their sales organization, but they don't necessarily represent one product, one solution. They may have others in the portfolio, right? So sell the product that makes sense. And so they're always wrestling for the mind share. And so it's amazing to me how as we started peeling this back and seeing massive amount of success around even social awareness of the platform, the product, the company brand, putting that front and center on our customers' social feeds, what that impact was to the channel partner organization, which essentially is if I'm a seller and I'm managing, let's just say 15 channel partners and each of those channel partners have, let's just say 30 sales reps. Well, guess what? I'm now basically becoming front and center, just using social alone on top of mine of my brand to my 15 channel partners times their 30 sales reps through social media. And so it's this almost as this trickle effect was, So whenever they had an opportunity, instead of, in this case, it was telecom. So instead of them thinking of AT&T or whoever might be, they're thinking of our customer because they're like, oh, John Smith. Oh yeah, I should, I I, got to call John. John's at the top of my list. John's at the top of my list. John's at the top of my list. And so that, that was a byproduct. Also, it was interesting. We never even thought about this was the channel itself they're still selling like kind of the old dinosaur methodology way, right? In terms of how they are engaging and they haven't yet holistically modernized their selling process. So it was like this whole giant ecosystem that opened up. We were like, man, we need to start tapping into some of these technology organizations who have these massive channels that they have not really remained top of mind for within the channel, number one. And number two, they're not utilizing modern selling techniques to teach the channel how to go about engaging with the buyer who's ultimately the customer that they want. So it was a very interesting uh, process and we're still, we're, we're finishing up the program right now to be able to see the different types of results and success. But we've always traditionally thought, go to market direct, teach the folks how to be able to engage with today's buyer. The reality is 
social extends all the way, video extends. So all the modern selling techniques utilizing these channels uh, or these, these technologies, excuse me, absolutely extends out into the channel for you to be able to gain mind share, gain market share, and for you to be able to help the channel learn how to sell better and to modernize their selling efforts as well. Yeah, it's, it's multi layers of an onion here, but uh, just to you know, draft off your LinkedIn, I started over 10 years ago you know, as a heavy user of LinkedIn. Yeah. But I cover, again, these 54 magazines every time they generate a list of the top 100 people, top 500 people. One just came out last week with the 700 women of the channel. I actually link in with every single person who's been on every single list for 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've now got 17 and a half thousand channel director or VPs on my own personal LinkedIn. Yep, yep, yep. And you know, when I get to these super connectors who I follow and I rank and I actually publish, um, you know, I'll have two or three thousand connections in common. But by an order of magnitude, probably by a five x multiplier, I'm the most connected channel person in the world based on my commitment to LinkedIn. Yep, yep. So yep. when I publish content or when I go and do a speech or whatever else I do, has a much bigger view than ever. And um, again, and reach. Your, your reach is yes. extensive, extensive. Yeah. So each of these channel managers report into these directors and VP. Right. And, uh, you know, you pick up a lot of that as well. So I, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn and very connected to where it's going, uh, you know, with Microsoft. So fabulous insights. Love what you've done to your own personal brand. And, and you do exactly as what I did and what others have done in terms of getting into whatever might be the sales, sales influence and, and marketing influencers, those types of things. So you're, you're right spot on in terms of how to leverage it. And now we just need to teach sellers how to leverage it to be able to connect with buyers. That's the aim. That's the goal right there. So l- let me ask you this last question. Speaking about all of what we talked about, what do you want sellers to take away from this? What, what, what is really the next step for a seller or a sales leader? I think it's to look much broader. We've talked a lot about permutations and combinations. If you get focused on your buyer and your prospects, what they read, where they go, and who they follow, there's probably 10 times the amount of people and companies that influence them that you think. If you get tighter, and it's not one of these things that's difficult. You can follow the breadcrumbs on the internet you can hire a $10 an hour intern to go do this for you to generate the list of 100 people who should be endorsing you and who you can be working with as super connectors, basically getting in front of your buyers through others as well as what they read and where they go. I mean, these things are, it's not rocket science, but most sellers get a little bit blinders, you know, in terms of what they're doing and, you know, going back into some old sales processes yeah. And not understanding all of these, you know, it's celestial. It's not linear. Yeah. There's so many things moving in the sky at one time that um, the more of it you can understand. And again, the more of it you can influence, influence the influence level, you're going to drive, you know, fantastic results. You know, I'm still challenged with one thing. And that is, why is it that sales organizations have such a hard time such a hard time with respects to co-selling with the channel. There's always this competition between direct and channel. And, and as a sales leader, my last role was the VP of sales for a software collaboration company. I could never understand. It's like make selling together for the end goal of closing business be the focus, right? Why does there have to be a conflict? Why do we have to arm wrestle over this? Get the channel out there, equip this channel. If they get into an opportunity, co-sell with them. If you're in an opportunity, co-sell with them. Why is there a competition? And I've never really seemed to be able to crack this code between the channel versus direct. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the number one reason is cultural. If you look at these hundred, you're in one of them, 175,000 companies at 30% of them are building a channel. But for the other two thirds, you need to prove yourself as a company. You need to prove that your product has value. You need to prove your selling process, your marketing process. So I always say, like, if you're going to you know, make hamburgers, you can't go and franchise until you've kind of locked down the process and you've got happy customers and it's repeatable. Every company has to start directly. And once they've kind of got to that point, building a channel is kind of like franchising. You're basically going to take everything you've built and like a McDonald's and open up locations around the world. 
Mm-hmm. But if you haven't built that success up front, and by the way, that your sales team has been with you for that success, you're not going to be able to do that. But when you start to make that turn into the channel, if you don't set that as the culture, in other words, every salesperson is paid on a channel deal or a direct deal, it doesn't matter. They're actually encouraged to go channel because now, like you said, they're dealing with 15 people who have 30 different salespeople and they're now territory managers. Yeah. Now they're going to start selling 10x what they used to because they're managing others. They're now managing sales. Right. Instead of leading sales. So, you know, it's a cultural thing. Upper management has to be on board. You have to have the systems in place, the commission structures in place. You have to have the channel conflict covered, uh, the rules of engagement. There's a number of steps you have to take to kind of dampen that culture and really drive that change within the company. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Jay McBain, the master and thought leader, the master thought leader, excuse me, on channel sales. Uh, Jay, loved this conversation. If someone wants to connect with you, we obviously heard that you're on LinkedIn. Uh, should they follow you on Twitter? Is it you know, on LinkedIn? Well, what's, what's the story? Where, what should they do? Yeah, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter is Jay McBain, just the letter J McBain. You can kind of visit my Forrester blog if you want to. I've got a lot of uh, different areas, but um, yeah, happy to make that connection. And that's uh, J-M-C-B-A-I-N for uh, his Twitter handle. We'll put that into the show notes uh, to you guys. And uh, your LinkedIn profile, if someone wants to reach out and connect with you, please, please do not just send my friend here a blind connection request. Tell him you heard him on Selling with Social. Jay, I've got one last question for you, bro. And that is your all-time favorite movie. What is it? My favorite movie is the original Superman with uh, that story. And it wasn't because it was a superhero. It's not like a Seinfeld thing with me. It was just the story of, you know, a, a kid that could be the all-star quarterback and yeah. you know, had to be the water boy. Yeah. And just that, you know, story of being different and kind of trying to fit in. So I just, one thing connected with me way back when I, with Christopher Reeves, you know, saw that original Superman. And I think from this day forward, it's just always touched me a different way. I don't think anything beats the original Superman with Christopher Reeves. <laughs> I love it. Jay, you're the man. I appreciate you joining me, my friend. All right. Take care. Hey, thanks for listening to the Selling with Social Sales podcast. Did you enjoy that show? If so, would you do me a huge favor and give the Selling with Social podcast a rating and review on iTunes? That would be super awesome. Also, if you want to easily find our show, just go to vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com and click on podcast. From there, you'll find the Selling with Social podcast. Thanks for listening in. And until the next show, be awesome. Mario Martinez Jr. <laughs>